Hi, my name is Mark Robinson. I'm with Revival Gardening. Uh, we make premium worm castings and organic soil amendments. Our whole thing is about uh, getting the soil right. So the plant has everything it needs from the soil, everything will take care of itself. So here in Florida, we've all got sand. And so we need a lot of different kinds of amendments and we like to do everything organically and as inexpensively as possible so you don't have the $200 tomato. And that you create a living soil so that you're not throwing your soils out, but you're just constantly building your soils up. And we do that with uh, different ingredients, different amendments. And we'll go through that here in a second. The reason I got into it was uh, for health reasons, okay? Uh, not just my health, but the health around me, my family and looking at things. Uh, we're just poisoning ourselves. Um, just constantly putting chemicals in the soil. Plants aren't doing well, so you're adding more chemicals and you're, you're, we're just making ourselves sick and our food has no nutrition in it. So I just looked for a better way uh, starting with my own health, my family's health, and then it just kind of evolved. I've met some folks who've taught me how to grow organically and how to do it inexpensively using natural ingredients and not a lot of them actually. Uh, and then what that does is it, it, it takes care of me, it takes care of my family. I have more energy. I can share this with other people. Uh, it, it just goes down the line. We're not putting poison in the soil. It's not draining into the waterways. It's not getting out in the oceans sequestering carbon. It's everything that everyone talks about what they want to do that's good for the earth. Well, it's all about just growing correctly like nature does. That's all we're doing is, is we're, we're mimicking nature using its products. Um, if we were in a different part of the country, it would be easier. We've got different soils, but here it's sand. So we got to start from the beginning. So when we talk about amending soil, okay, what we're just talking about is really bringing the soil to what nature would have had it normally if we didn't get in the way. Now you go out into a forest uh, that nobody messes with, that nobody's doing, you know, walking through or, you know, foresting, taking down trees. And if you step into there, there's hundreds of different plants. Um, every plant does something different. Some plants take nitrogen from the air and fix it to the soil. Some take it out of the soil. Different plants take up different nutrients. Uh, put different nutrients back in, what have you. They grow up, the leaves fall down, land on the ground. The biology breaks that down and composts it. That gets down into the root system. It goes back up into the plants and trees. And it's a cycle. When you start in your backyard, you don't have a forest with 200 plants adding natural amendments, okay, natural nutrients. The cycle's been interrupted when they constructed the place and put down sod. So we're dealing basically here in Florida with sand. So we have to start getting the, the right organics back into the soil so that we can get that back into our plants. And then if we, initially we have to amend the soil, add things, okay? And then as we go, if we companion plant, if we rotate our crops, if we compost our materials and add that back, we can actually build a living soil and keep building it better and better as, as if a forest was there. But we got to start here with the basic shot in the arm. Otherwise, if we wanted to build our soils using totally organic and not buying anything, it would probably take us about three years to get the soil ready to really be able to, to grow something enough to go through the efforts. So this is a jump start. So what got us into all of this, okay, is I was doing research for a company called Terviva and they were growing the pongamia tree, or we call it karanja, here in Florida. Initially, it was to make biodiesel. Then that market kind of dropped, but I had learned about the plant and I got to meet a soil biologist from them, who was an organic guy. So I met their soil biologist at Terviva and we started talking because I like to try to grow organically. And he's been doing it for 30 years. His name is Jim Bennett and he goes by the moniker Clackamas Coop. We looked him up and the guy knows what he's talking about. So we became friends and I just started listening to what he was telling me. And he was explaining to me about how to create a living soil and do it as inexpensively as possible. And so just over time, every day, just working with him and learning about each one of these ingredients and what they do and how to use them and the ratios of what they've already 
uh, they, ba they basically had formulas that they've developed over the years that they know work. And so he would give me the formulas and he said, you know, I'll give them to you, but you have to share them. We said, okay. Um, and then he taught me about the different ingredients, where to get them, um, what form they should be in, how to apply them. And funny enough, as I go through it, a lot of the ingredients that we use to make soil mixes, we use to make our teas for either feeding the plants or for integrated pest management, IPM, uh, for keeping pests and diseases away. Or if you screwed up and you got there late, get rid of pests and diseases. But they're basically all the same products just used in different ways. And they're all natural products. Um, you get into uh, Karanja cake or Karanja meal. Uh, that's also known as Pond Game. It's now grown here in Florida, processed here in Florida. It's been used around the world for thousands of years. It's a natural fertilizer. The tree's a legume. And it's got properties that'll fight nematodes and different pests. A lot of um, antibacterial, antifungal properties in there. Uh, kelp meal. Over 60 vitamins and minerals, um, gibberellic acids. This stuff is uh, harvested from the sea, dried and chopped. Uh, this is like taking a vitamin. This is all your micronutrients. Um, you get into neem cake. Um, everyone knows neem oil, or most people know neem oil for fighting pests. Well, that's the cake that's left over after they press that seed. So there's still some oils left in there, micro amounts, plus 200 other constituents for Again, fertilizing both the neem and the karanja. Uh, if you go to an Indian store, you'll see they're used in toothpaste, health products, beauty products. So there's a lot of good properties in all these things. You could actually eat it. I wouldn't say it would taste very good, but um, you could do that. There's other products. There's there's um, humic acid. Uh, we use this in different ways. We get into all these separately, but uh, Agsil... 16H, which is a potassium silicate. This can be used for preventative measures in plants. And it can be also used if you got to jump on a disease or a problem. This can also be used to emulsify neem oil if you want to use botanical oils as a pesticide. You would you have to emulsify it first. You would use this. It also comes this way in liquid form. OK, but this is about three times as cheaper. and You just mix it with water. Okay. Uh, alfalfa meal. This is the poor man's sea kelp. Uh, a lot of folks, they'll, they'll get their uh, garden set up. They'll, they'll do fine, whether it's you make a coots mix or a, you buy a store bought. And after the first round of vegetables come off, if you do a soil test, you'll find they might be a little low on nitrogen. This puts it back in. It's got mannitol in it. And uh, that's like a growth hormone. This will jumpstart your plants too. And so you can use these in different ratios. Crab shell meal is, or crab meal, crustacean meal is really just crab shell, shrimp shell, lobster shell, dried out, crushed up. It's a slow release nitrogen. It's got chitin in it. And the chitins will go after nematode problems. Okay. We've got um, the probiotic. Where did I put that? Here. This is the same thing as this, except it's micronized, okay? And so you can make a, a liquid solution and spray it down into your soil if you've got nematode problems. Okay, then a couple other things. Um, these are wreath and nuts. This, these are uh, soap nuts. And they've got saffinins in here and you can use this as preventative measure or you can use this to emulsify um, botanical oils or we sometimes put it in combination with these other teas. It can be used as a foliar spray or a soil drench. Um, and then malted barley grains. This is the stuff they make beer with. It is full of enzymes. It's inexpensive. This is in its uh, form as it comes. It needs to be run through the grinder. And you can usually get this done at the brew store. They'll grind it for you. If not, you know, we've got a big Vita mix, whatever, and we just grind it up real quick or on the... Up on the farm, we have a, a machine we just put it in. Um, and this is used in a lot of our feeding teas because of the enzymes, what's well, in the enzymes. Um, aloe vera, that's aloe vera juice. You can use fresh aloe vera. If you've got fresh aloe vera, that's the best. 
and they make a powder which I don't have here with me today but you just take like a quarter and a half teaspoon per gallon of water and aloe vera is magic for plants it's got saffodins in it it's got salicylic acid in it and plants just respond like crazy uh, to aloe vera uh, we can use aloe vera with ag silk and just basically mix it on the spot and spray it and you can watch the plants react to it it's unbelievable um, so again we just see there's different ingredients these are basically it and we mix and match these things either in soil or in preventative teas or feeding teas and so if you want we can get into a little deeper about what's in each one of these things and, yeah go ahead okay uh let's see we'll start with let me get my full sheet out because there's so much in here. We'll start with the barley grain. Okay. So I just, I've got to kind of just look at this because there's just so much information here. But this, it's about the, uh, the enzymes. And what they do is they break down the uh, bioavailable nutrients for the plant. So it's got amylase. That's what's in your saliva and pancreatic fluid. And it converts glycan into simple sugars. And your biology in the soil likes simple sugars. Your plant makes simple sugars and sends it down to the biology in the soil. And the biology in the soil sends the nutrients back up. It's an exchange between the plant and the living organisms in the soil. Okay. It's got aerial sulfatase, breaks down sulfates. And there's there's a much more detail, and you can get it off the website. B glucodase, glucose, cellulase. Chitinase, dehydrogenase, phosphatase, protease, one of these zases, those are enzymes, but protease is protein. So it breaks down protein, makes it bioavailable to the plant. So that's, and you get simple sugars out of this. So that's what malted barley grains can do for you. And you can put them in your soil, it's a little slower release. Or if you make it into a tea, if you need a quick shot, you can do that, okay? Uh, one thing we don't have here is rock dust. We use granite dust and, um, it's it's a it's a slow release of elements and trace minerals, and I mean slow, because the only thing that breaks down rocks is weathering and and uh, organisms on it. Slow release, but you have your bacteria likes to adhere to it, and the bacteria are trying to break it down. That enzyme cycle keeps going, so it creates things. But um, it it'll increase the nutrient uptake of the plants, uh, increases your yield and a higher bricks rating, which is the sugar content. Rebalances soil pH, uh, increases earthworm activity and the growth of microorganisms. It builds a humus complex, prevents soil erosion, increases the storage capacity of the soil, of the soil um, increases resistance to insects, disease, frost, and drought. It produces a more nutritious crop, enhances the flavor in the crop, and then it decreases your dependency on fertilizers and pesticides and things of that sort. And that's just in a rock dust. I don't even have that here, but, you know, it's gray. It looks gray. But either a rock dust or a basalt will work. They're both paramagnetics. Okay. The kelp meal. Okay. And this is Norwegian kelp. Ascophilum notosum is what it's called. There are other kelps, but this is the kelp to use. Uh, they get it from the North Atlantic near Nova Scotia. It's dried. It's chopped. 60 plus trace minerals, vitamins, amino acids, and plant hormones. Okay. So it's like a mineral soup. It comes from the sea. They take the plant, they basically cut it off, dry it, and chop it. That's how it's handled. That's part of the uh, North Atlantic Treaty on the, how they do kelp. Um, it just boosts the efficiency of everything. And it takes all those micronutrients. Okay. Uh, the racehorses eat this. It's in your expensive dog meal. We actually put this in our milkshakes. We don't buy the $30 liquid vitamin anymore. We take a teaspoon of that in our shake and get the same thing. It's a fraction of the cost. Those are your vitamins right there. Come get familiar with it. Don't breathe any of the dust, but smell it. Touch it, feel it. And smell that, tell me what, what it smells like. Like um, the sea? Like seaweed. Yeah. Like the seaweed, uh -huh. okay. See how fine it is? It's a nice small granule. Sometimes it can come a little flakier, a little larger flakes, it doesn't matter. Uh, this works real well in the soil like that. Mm -hmm. But when you make a tea and you soak it, either, either bubble it overnight or soak it for 24 hours, 
all that stuff gets into the tea so the liquid will go through your soil faster remember we're dealing with sand okay so uh, if we do a top dressing of any of these materials it'll slowly go down through it every time either waters or rain but if we need a quick shot we make a tea okay like i said you can eat this this is all food grade okay so that is what north atlantic sea kelp looks like okay we sell a lot of this because it's used in almost everything we do so the liquid kelp that you would buy in the store gotta be, is pretty much different. we got to be different. careful okay. of the liquid kelp. Okay. How do you preserve liquid kelp? That I don't know. you got to read the mm -hmm. bottles because a lot of it has the same chemicals that do other things, that burn things. You don't, mm. we don't ever use liquid kelp, ever, ever, ever. Okay. okay. We get the dry and we do everything with dry and we make our own teas. This business, there's a lot of rackets where people take something, they make a liquid, they all you got to do is add it to water. Yeah. And so I don't have to make a tea and soak it, you know, for eight hours with a bubbler or, or 24 hours. It's instant because everyone wants instant. Yeah, but there's a chemical in there to preserve that. If you're going truly organic, mm -hmm. do you want that chemical? Okay. And it's not necessarily cheaper. They usually take about that much of this and some other stuff and charge you whatever they charge you for that bottle. Okay, again, this is the same thing as this at a third the price. Okay. okay? Yes. So you gotta, you always, yeah, read the labels. <clears throat> so you can take this kelp, okay, and you can top dress. We have instructions on the site, depending on if I'm doing a square foot garden or if I'm doing a certain type of plant, you can get the information of how much to top dress. And then we have the tea formulas on the site and we'll go through those in a little bit. And so you can tell you how much of the tea, depending on what we're making. So it varies, not just depending on the individual <coughs> soil amendment, but the type of gardening that you're trying to do and the types of yeah, plants yeah. that you're trying to grow. Exactly, I mean, because if you're doing row crops in a field, like this would be too expensive to do a hundred acre farm, <clears throat> dry. Okay, that's where this would then be converted into big vats where they'll bubble it and use it as a liquid, make teas, and spray the teas out. For the home gardener, this is fantastic. And again, what this puts into the soil, what gets into your plant, now your plants are, you know, got that nutrition. We're trying to get nutritionally dense food, okay, and healthy plants. So that's why this is real important, okay? These two... I'm gonna open it at the same time because I want you to see the difference because they're brown, right? And if I grind this up, when I'm feeding this to worms in a worm feed, I grind it to that consistency. And it's so that it can pass through worms. <clears throat> but when you're making tea or putting the soil, the cake is fine. So smell that, play with that. Did I grab, uh, let me go open this one. This one's, this one's sealed, sorry about that. Okay, so this is Karanja. And that's what, it, that's was just done a week ago. Okay, this just came from the factory here in Fort Pierce. And see how it's all like pressed, it's a cake, but it just falls apart. And they take the seed and they press the oil out. And now these, they're doing this for two things. Now they're making a fertilizer for us. It's also a cattle feed. They have a thing to remove the constituency that makes it constipated. Hmm. And they're found a way to make this so it's edible and they're using the oil now, okay? I mean, people around the world use it for paints and for lighting and for whatever, but they now have it so it's a substitute for vegetable oil. Oh. And they get high yields off these trees which takes little input. I mean, it does cost, doesn't cost as much to grow these trees and it produces a lot of oil. So this is the leftover seed. And what does it smell like to you? Like a... You bring it closer to the camera. Yeah, it's kind of hard to describe the smell. It's like a cereal? Maybe a cereal, yes. To me, it's like a written like a whole grain cereal or something. Oh, okay. That's to like me. Like my grape nuts. <laughs> yeah, like a grape nut. It kind of looks like a grape nut, it right? Does. It does. So that's what that smells like. Now this is neem and that's fresh. So you want to be able to tell fresh now that you know what fresh Karanja smells like. Right. Okay. This lasts about a year before it starts losing things. Okay. 
That is neem. Okay. Same thing. The neem seeds crushed. The oil's taken out. People have been using that for a insecticide. It's not really insecticide. We'll explain that in a minute. Mm -hmm. But that's what's left over and it's ground up. What, is it, what does it smell like to you? To me, it's a coffee. Yeah. Oh, coffee types. Just That's just me. But now you know that you could distinguish if somebody blind tested you, you could tell. Right, I could tell you the difference in the sense. And it's not like anything else you've ever smelled, right? So if you ever smelled the neem oil? Yeah, I've used neem oil, but I don't you never think thought I've ever about smelled it. It. <laughs> it doesn't smell like this, though. No, I don't. It, it, I, don't it, I, I tell smell. you, it doesn't smell like that. Yeah. But that's what's it. left over. Can you can smell it from here. here? You can smell it from there? I can smell it through the mask. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it smells good. It smells edible. <laughs> Well, this is, believe it or not, people in India, they, that's in toothpaste. It's almost like a cocoa, like a chocolate kind of. Is that what you get out of from, yeah, from back there with bit, it? Yeah. Yeah. You could, you could say they got hints of that in there. Well, the big active ingredient here, okay, is the azadiractin. That's what's in the neem oil. So when you buy neem oil, you need to make sure it's 100% neem oil or is it the, it was the azadiractin taken out of that and then put into a carrier oil. Mm. Okay, you wanna use pure neem oil. We use this in preventative, in the soils itself, so it becomes in the soil, it becomes systemic in the plant, along with the 200 other constituents in the seed that they don't talk about. The micro things that make it all really happen. The neem tree in India is a sacred tree because of all the healing properties of what's in this tree. Mm. There's a story, There's we've got a book here, um, the guys who wrote the story on Neem, a doctor went to Africa, real quick, basically a locust came through and took everything out except this one tree, didn't touch it. And they found it was a Neem tree. So he spent his life researching why the bugs wouldn't touch this tree. Okay. And it's because of what's in it. And it's, a, and it's actually a sacred tree in India. Do these trees grow in the United States? They do. Um, we grow this here in Florida now, oh. and it's in Texas now because Derviva, th there was some wild ones and some stray ones in South Florida that were brought here a long time ago, but now it's being commercially grown and planted right here, and it's being processed right here in Florida. The neem, they say, won't grow north of I-4 because of the frost line. In the last two weeks, I have been to five people's houses who are growing neem trees here, so it does grow here, okay? And they... Their tradition, some of these people, they actually eat the leaves and stuff for the, for the health benefits. And some of them take the leaves because the leaves, the bark, the nuts, everything is used. And they actually take it and put it into their IPM regimen. They're actually growing their own IPM and fertilizers from a tree in their yard. Nice. Okay, so you could actually grow this and have half the benefits of taking care of pests or just fertilizing because you're growing your own tree and using the nuts and the leaves and what have you off of it. And anybody can do it here. There's a lot of different things you can grow here that, that are made to chop and drop fertilizers, living fertilizers. Okay, you don't always have to buy anything. You have to kickstart it, but you can get there. So that's those two. <clears throat> I'm gonna let you smell. Um, uh, he's laughing. You're, you're gonna like this one. <laughs> so let's talk about the crab meal. Okay, let's see, I wonder what that'll smell like. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> and see, it, it's crab shell, right? Oh, yeah. It's crustacean shell. It's, it's like actually the crabs. <laughs> they call it crab shell. It's actually crab shell, shrimp shell, and lobster shell, dried and crushed. And it smells like dead crabs. dried dead crabs, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is a slow release nitrogen, and it's got chitin, and this will go after nematodes. So we put this in our, in our soil mixes just for long-term nitrogen. Because uh -huh. uh, our soil mixes are usually in raised bed or containers, and we don't seem to have nematodes per se because it's we're, we're, we're containing it. Now, that's not to say if somebody bought a plant and brought it in and it had a nematode in it, that it wouldn't get into the soil. Well, this would help prevent that kind of stuff. Um, with slugs, would that be <clears throat> assistance with the sharper edges? Um, not so much the sharper edges. <clears throat> there is a... You said slugs. I was reading something this morning. One of these things will go after slugs and things. I'm trying okay. to remember which one it was. There's, they do more than I'm telling you. I'm giving you the basics here. Okay. 
Then this crab meal comes like this, okay? And that's just micronized. And the, and the consist I don't want to open this right now because the consistency is like cornstarch. Oh, okay. And it's it's such a light powder. You got to have your mask on when you use it. You don't want to breathe the dust, okay? Because you just don't want to get it in your lungs. It's nasty. Um, but you just mix it with water, and it's so fine that it just stays suspended. If you're going to put it in one of the sprayers, you might want to shake it once in a while to keep the suspension going. But this is great with. Um, uh, if you had a nematode problem that you discovered, like this is to kind of prevent it, right? Right. And if you've got a small raised bed and maybe you have nematode problems in general in the area, you definitely add this to your soil mix, right? Um, but if you didn't and the nematode showed up on you, right? One tablespoon per gallon of water. This is $12. You can't, the, the, the economics of this yeah. are ridiculous. When you think this will make a hundred gallons of, of liquid right okay and that's just to this also has uh, nitrogen in it and phosphate okay so again slow release okay you got a nitrogen problem you hit it with this if you got a nematode problem you hit it with this it's good to put either one of these into your soil okay but the reason they made it micronized okay is if you have um, a series of problems with, let's say, powdery mildew, something that you would normally use a copper fungicide on to get rid of, there's an item. It's a called a it's a biofungicide. And there's a few companies that make them, and this this prebiotech was was tested with all of them, okay. But this item called Double Nickel 55, it worked the best way. So this is double nickel 55. I just brought you the template sheet on it. This is sold by Certus. A five pound bag is $175. Oh my God, who's going to use this? Except commercial growers. But all this is is Bacillus amyloquifacis, some kind of strain of bacteria. Can't pronounce. And that bacteria will go after a whole host of things. Hmm. So what this was designed to do with the chitin was to feed that bacteria so colony forming units they call it right so whatever this gets in there this will exemplify it by like twenty-five thousand times so two teaspoons of this so we're bringing this in and we're going to put it in small packages so that it becomes affordable because otherwise it's just not affordable well then you would use two teaspoons of this and one tablespoon of this together in a gallon of water so if you had powdery mildew you walked in you weren't doing preventative maintenance or you went on vacation, whatever, and all of your cucumbers and squash have powdery mildew, you would do a gallon of water and spray everything down with this, be done with it. You can also take that same formula and do a preemptive strike in your garden and put it in the ground and spray it on your plants before anything shows up. Again, integrated pest management. So you're feeding the plants, right, with the nitrogen, you're building good bacteria and stuff that'll fight off the diseases here. Uh, what some nurseries do is they take this and they pre-treat their starts. So you could take this in your nursery operation. You could spray that. You can make the liquid spray it. And once you get your plant up, spray it in it, soak it, and then send it out to be planted. And you know it's been kind of inoculated. And then it's up to the guys out in the field to watch as it gets bigger if it's going to need more of that. But you can pre-inoculate with this. You can be proactive with it. Right. Or you can be reactive with it. Yeah, okay. proactive is better. Proactive is always better. <laughs> always better. Um, can we talk about alfalfa? Alfalfa, and here's a trade secret for everybody. It's a pro tip. Don't buy it online. Buy it at the feed store. It comes in pellet form. Okay, smell that. Tell me what it smells like, too. Green. <laughs> Smells green. This is what farmers used to use to fertilize their fields. They grew alfalfa and they chopped and tilled it in. Like, you know, for thousands of years until the chemical guys showed up, right? This will put nitrogen back. So it's got other a lot of other uses for it. This stuff is just dynamite. Um, 
when you go to the feed store, uh, I went last week because we were feeding some of this to the worms make, with our worm feed. And there was a 50 pound bag for $14.99 or a 40 pound bag for $14.99 organic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we put this through a grinder because again, we're feeding it to the worms as a part of the worm feed, but it comes in a pellet form. You can grind it up if you want to make a tea. It doesn't really matter. The pellets are made so that when water hits it, they break apart. Oh, okay. Okay. But for $15, you get a 40 pound bag of this to fertilize your garden and a 40 pound bag will go a long way. So I always say do a soil test first, but, but yeah, get this at the feed store. Can't okay. beat the price. Okay. Just can't beat the price. The malted barley grains, which we talked about, get it at the brew store. Cannot beat the price. They're not, the only way I can beat the price on this is if I buy tractor trailer load. And I don't buy tractor trailer loads. I buy 50 pound bags all the day long. But yeah, this is like a dollar a pound at the brew store ground up for you. Oh, wow. Yeah, you can't, that's where you go buy that direct. Buy this direct. The rest of this, we kind of handle this. Now, I want to show you something, this Axil 16H, okay? There's a whole thing on this. I just got to go get this out. It's just, mm -hmm. this it's stuff's incredible. So <clears throat> potassium silicate, the second largest mineral deposit out there in the world is silicates, sand, what have you. Well, then why do we need this? It's not in the form. It's the silicon has got to be S-I-L-I-C-I-C. Silicic? Silicic acid. Okay. So that's the form that this is silicic acid. And if you do a soil test, you should have 100 ppm of monosilicic acid in it. Well, what this does, it supports your plant cell walls. So you know in a plant, think of the plant has arteries and veins where moisture and nutrients go up and the sugars go back down in the walls of the plants, right? Well, if you don't have strong cell walls, what happens? You can take this as proactive. You can do it with every watering, whether it's fertilizer, it doesn't matter. You can use it every single time if you want to. This is the liquid form of it. Of course, by they put it in liquid and put, a, put it in a bottle, so they charged you more. And this stuff works great, okay? Even when you make this into a liquid, you got to shake them because okay. it because it the silicate settles, right? Wow. So you got to shake it up real well. 20 milliliters half a teaspoon per gallon. It goes a long, long way, okay? But at first sign of a disease or a bug, you can spray this on. And what it does, it calls forth all of those things in the plant to create like an armor, it creates the cell strength so that bugs can't penetrate, so that bacteria can't penetrate, okay? But you gotta keep feeding it that to handle the problem. <clears throat> we use it with aloe vera powder Aloe vera powder has a salicylic acid in it, okay? And that creates the SAR in a plant. It takes, it turns the whole plant on to defend itself. And then you add stuff like this, you give it the components to do that, and it fights off whatever's bugging it. If you do it as a preventative in your IPM, integrated pest management is also diseases, right? Then you know, these things don't show up. But if they do, you can hit it with this, okay? And we use this in conjunction by itself. We use this in conjunction with these different teas, these feeder teas. So we're already giving it to the plant. We're either spraying it on the foliar, top and bottom, or we're putting it into the soil. So we're constantly feeding and protecting these plants and building that living soil. But this stuff, everybody should have a bag of this. Okay. Okay. It's just, it's not, it's not expensive and it can be used in so many different ways. And so that's, the, the base ingredients, um, more or less, um, you can, the humic acid, this is an important part. We have it in our soils that we make as we use Florida peat in our, the way we make our, uh, our compost and the way we make our castings and our soil mixes. So we kind of have it in there, but we always like to add more. So this, we just say, just go buy this on Amazon. There's humic acid in those those type of things. Humus, the word humus. Okay. Humic, yeah. There's 
once you start doing this, you start correlating different different things because all of this really is it's it's biology and it's chemistry. You think about it. A plant takes energy from the sun and turns it into food that we eat. Just think about that. Takes the sun's energy and we get food that we eat. Well, how does it do that? Well, the green in the plant makes chlorophyll. It's chlorophyll. That makes sugar. Sugar is sent down to the biology. The biology is breaking things down with all these enzymes and nutrients and vitamins and minerals and different things that we haven't even studied yet. And it's sending them back. The plant's calling for X amount of whatever it needs. And so they're exchanging and they're feeding each other. And then it grows a fruit and then we eat it. And that's how we feed our bodies. And all of this starts with the sun. Yeah. Believe it or not. And people, if you really think about it, plants are converting things to food for us to eat and the animals to eat. Kind of an amazing thing, you know? So it's complicated, but so it's biology and it's chemistry. And um, like I say, I didn't invent this. The formulas we use are the ones that we were taught that they have used over the years. And there's different ways and different combinations. You go, okay, I don't have that. I can use that and achieve the same results. Now we always tell everybody take a soil test and <clears throat> you can buy the little soil test for pH. They kind of okay, right? And we use them just to get a basic, are we way off or are we kind of in range? But we have a form in a bag that we give to our clients and you can take a soil sample, send it to the University of Florida for $10 pH, all the different nutrient levels. They go through a whole list of things and send you back a recommendation. And it basically comes back and says, your pH is this, you need this much nitrogen or phosphorus, you're high or low on these, and it tells you everything. And from that, I can read and go, oh, everything looks good, but you need some more nitrogen. Well, I can do it this way. If you got pests in the area, we can do it with the Karanja, or we can mix them both. We could take the pellets and um, we have a gentleman's got a big in-ground garden. And we had him take a test. Was, Everything's good, but I need nitrogen. Okay. And we knew he kind of had a deficiency by looking at his plants, but he was massively growing lettuces and vegetables. I mean, just intense. So, hey, here's some pellets. Go put it in there. Okay. And then we gave him some Karanja because he's got some other things going on. And it works. Do you ever have a situation where you add too much of a certain one and then you have to offset it with another one and you have to kind of do a balance no act. no um these are not made the way these work they don't burn or really harm your plants they're all beneficial now yeah if i were to dump if i were to dump this whole thing in your potted plant i'm going to change something okay but that's you've got to kind of be ridiculous what we always tell everybody is if you're going to use the teas, like we use the teas religiously, like on a Wednesday, we'll do the soil and we literally make a tea overnight. We bubble it and we'll show you how to do that in a minute. It's super easy. Or you can let it sit for 24 hours if you don't have a bubble. And we strain it, drain it, put it in, and we just spray it on the soil. And we're done. Then sometime on the weekend when we get done with our coffee, we do one and we just spray all the leaves and we're done. We're just done. We don't have pest problems. You go out and you pick your food at night, you know, whatever. When you walk by, you're going to see a little weed, you pull it out and it's just, it's not a chore anymore. And everything's going right. And we're getting what we want out of our plants. Um, but yeah, you have to kind of go overboard. So what we say, if you're doing it regular, you can go kind of light on the formulas. The formulas are really made for mid range, kind of a, when you see our formulas, like once a week type thing. Okay. But if you're going to be religious about it, you can go a little bit lighter and just feed it as it goes along. Think about it. Um, the plant will take out of the soil what it needs when it needs it. Okay. If I dump everything in our sandy soil, <clears throat> where do you think it's going to go? Right on through the sand, especially like in the summer when it's raining all the time. It's just the sand's a filter. That's why we have sand and there's, there's no organic matter. There's nothing to hold it together. Right? You got to create humus to hold it together. The only way to do that is, is build your soils back up. Okay. You get started with this, but you still got to add your organics. You still got to compost if you want to build your soils. Otherwise, you're buying this all the time. You get jump started with this. You use your composting. You use beneficial plants that don't take these inputs. 
that grow native here in the soil. You let them grow up, you chop them down, you use them as fertilizer, use them as compost, use them as organic matter. And so once you've jump started, it gets real inexpensive to garden here. And the cost benefit of, of doing that is, you know what? We're saving money because we're not buying groceries. A lot of them. And you're eating nutritionally dense food without the chemicals, which will save you on your health bill when you get to my age. <laughs> So in terms of the process, <clears throat> if you start with that pH test, how much time and energy is that saving you if you're not having to like play a guessing game and you already know kind of where you're starting at? And how does that vary from person to person? Well, the pH test, when we do a, when we do our, our Clackamas Coot mix with the formulas online, it's already, we already know. It's gonna come out exactly 6.5. We know our organics are at 7.1, 7.2 but the peat moss is at three, 3.5. When you add them together with the castings, it drops into a six, five. These really don't affect the pH much. So in case, in case people <clears throat> don't know, so, uh, just explain like seven neutral and then which direction is basic and acidic. Right, so you wanna be in the, you wanna be between six and seven, okay? Which is? Which is the optimum range. Seven is exactly neutral, Right. okay? And then basic is lo less low. Than seven. Yeah, your alkaline's high. It's easier to come your up. Your ba yeah. So, but it's easier to come up on your scale by adding calcium carbonate. Once you get to seven five, it's harder to come down on the scale. It takes acidic. longer. But you can offset that. Let's say you let's say you have a garden, and you got a higher pH. If you wanted to bring it down, you could just put sphagnum peat moss. Canadian sphagnum peat moss. That'll bring the pH back down faster. And you're adding organic matter and some good biology. But that's more difficult. No, that's the easy one to do. To bring it up. To bring it up. To bring it up, bring it up is easy. To bring it down can be a little more difficult. It takes longer with sulfur. It just takes longer. We'll bring it down with the peat to get it in range if it's, if it's high. But to bring it up, calcium carbonate. And here they suggest with dolomitic lime, that's got magnesium. Magnesium locks things in the soil. And how much does that vary from the people that you've talked to and that you've worked with? Is it like well, usually? No, it's usually usually the pH is okay because most people buy a potted mix, right? And they've kind of bounced, they make it so you're successful, right? More or less. They might put the chemical nutrients in there so that you get three months or six months. If you read the bag, six months of fertilizer. So they've already added it to it. The question is, was that organic or was that the chemical salt kind, okay? And again, do you, do you wanna be organic or you don't care, okay? So they've already bounced out their soil so that your plants are gonna grow. What happens at the end of, let's say three months after you've grown your tomatoes, is you've used up nutrients. Your pH is not really gonna be that affected so much, but you're probably gonna need nitrogen and some other things. So how do I get that back in? I can do it this way or I can go buy a bottle of miracle grow and hit it with the liquid. It'll all grow the plant, but is the soil alive? Or are you doing just like the orange industry did? They just dropped chemicals in water and got oranges. And then they got hit with the bug that wiped out the industry because there were no natural plant defenses. It was all one variety. You can, you can eliminate the problems by having diversity by doing it naturally. Again, go look at a forest that's untouched. Yeah, there's some bug holes here and there, but in general, it's in balance, right? All the, all the bugs in the world, that many bad bugs. The soil's got bacteria, it's got fungi, it's got different critters in there, all different kinds, a whole list. Yeah. And they all play a part. They're not just there. One eats or exudes or gives off something else that the other one lives on. It's all part of the cycle. In the monocrop field, that's, you <clears> don't have that. No, and they're going for volume. And that's fine. And I understand you got to feed the world, but we as individuals can better feed ourselves local and fresh with a lot less inputs and, and definitely less impact on the environment, okay? Uh, but again, for me, it was the nutritional. I need energy. I need, I need not to be sick. I can't afford to be sick, okay? I can't afford the bill. I can't afford to be not working. And who wants to feel like that anyways, right? Five gallon bucket. 
Now, depending on the T formula, all we're gonna do, we use this. This is a, um, it's a paint strainer bag from Home Depot. You can get two of them for $3. You can use a pantyhose. You can use cheesecloth. It doesn't matter, okay? We'll take this bag and we'll scoop out, depending on the formula, maybe it's a cup, maybe it's a half a cup, maybe it's a cup and a half. We just tie it up. <clears throat> we hang it from the bucket, tie it off here. And this bucket has five gallons of water in it. One caveat, non-chlorinated. So how do I get non-chlorinated water without buying easy? The rain. You just sit it out for a day. Let the sun work on it. It'll, all the chlorine will evaporate out of it. So you can actually get up in the morning, fill the bucket, let the sun evaporate the chlorine that night. When you come home, make a tea bag and hang it in here. Okay. We like to do it the next morning because most of this stuff, it's best before the sun gets on it. Okay. We just take a bubbler, drop the air stones in. Plug it in and just let it bubble for eight hours. And what that bubbling action does, it takes, when you have a, you know, you drink tea regularly, you take your little tea bag and you swish it up and down, does that automatically for you because of the air agitation, okay? All right, I don't have a bubbler. I don't want to buy a bubbler, not a problem. Leave the bag in for 24 hours. And every once in a while, I'll do this, okay? That's it. Bubbler overnight. 24 hours, more or less, doesn't have to be exact. If it only got a cup and, you know, and a quarter, who cares? It doesn't matter. But when you get done, you bring it all up and you squeeze all that out. You're going to be left with some muck in here. Do not throw that away. That's still got the goodies in it, right? You just take it out and put it around your plants. A little messy, but your plants are going to love you for it. I mean, you'll see a big difference. So then you'll have this tea left. Now this tea is going to have some little particles in it. So if you've got a, you got a little Home Depot sprayer or something around here, like this one here. So if you have a sprayer like this, most people do at Home Depot are like 15 bucks or something. You got to make sure that when you put a funnel in here and you put your tea in that you somehow strain it. Okay. So don't you get the little particles because it could clog the tips up. Okay. And you just basically pump it up and spray it. We use the bigger sprayers. <clears throat> like this okay and the reason this is actually a concrete sprayer made to spray chemicals so this is going to last us forever because we don't spray chemicals in it but it's solid brass construction and it gives us a nozzle that we could actually spray up into trees or swap the nozzle out and spray underneath and if it somehow gets clogged up we literally just unscrew the brass machine tip blow it out, and we're back in business. Nice. This thing holds three and a half gallons. We love this sprayer. Yeah, we gotta handle it, take yeah, it around, it's but, <laughs> but it's a little heavy, but we know, but it's the last sprayer we're ever gonna buy. Good okay? Idea. We had the small sprayers, and uh, these here from the Home Depot, every few months, $15 adds up for a while. You can get these for $120 on Amazon. You know, and it's, and it's just done for you. And you can get a lot more done with it. So that's all it is about making tea and sticking it in a sprayer. Now, you don't have a sprayer, but you want to do a soil drench. If you had to, you could just pour the bucket out. Or you can just get a watering can. Just water around your plants. You don't feel like if you don't have a bag, let's say you're not going to put it in a sprayer. You could literally take these same ingredients and just throw them in the bucket. Swish it around, either use a bubbler or don't, or just swish it around. Same thing. You don't have to have a bag. We just like it because it's easier. It's less to strain out, okay? But if I was just gonna do a soil drench and I had no pump, I would just throw the ingredients, five gallon bucket of water, dump it in my water can, and who cares if particles go in there? Right, you're gonna put it in there. You're gonna put it in there anyways, yeah. right? So it's really that easy to make a tea. So now comes the question of what tea? Well, there's bunches, bunches of teas. So the question is, what do you want to do? Also, how, when that tea is made, how malleable is it? Like, can you add more things to it or should you keep it how it is, how you originally made well, it? Well, when you do the tea, you want to use it right away. 
Oh, the, yeah, whole, not, the whole thing. The whole thing. You're not going to let it hang out for days. That's not a good thing. It'll start to get rank on you. Use it fresh. Okay. But the tea itself. So we talked about putting things into a bag and soaking them, right? So let's say I was going to do a feed tea, what we call our feed tea, which is malted barley grains. There's a certain a ratio. The formulas are online. Um, we put Karanja and Neem here in Florida because we want, we got more pest problems. We want more fighting action, right? And North Atlantic sea kelp. So we'll put, we'll put these four things together. Okay. That's our nutrient tea. Now we're feeling lucky. Mm, it's maybe, it's too, maybe, okay. So we have malted barley grains, Neem cake. Garanja cake and North Atlantic sea kelp. That's our base, what we call our basic feed tea. Sometimes we add alfalfa to it, especially if we know someone's been, you know, using their garden a lot, not letting it rest, and they need a little more nitrogen. We'll drop some alfalfa in there. You can mix and match. You can do whatever you want. Okay, but that's our basic feed tea. Now, if we haven't, for some reason, we've been busy and we've missed spraying for a couple of weeks. We'll take our feed tea. We'll drop some ag sill in there. Uh, we might use some retha nut, aloe vera. We kind of put all the tools in the toolbox at one time and just go spray it off. And it'll just kind of like, like a general cover everything for you. So we start with our feed tea and then in the summertime, especially this because of the it supports the cell walls. So you want the plants being up full of you know, water and you want to be at the right angle because they got to collect sun. The plants know how to work their own solar system. Look at banana plants, you look at any of these plants and you look at the way they, they position the leaves during the day, the plants know where they need to be. But to do that, they got to have good, strong cells. And that's what this helps achieve, this ag cell. Okay, amongst a bunch of other things. So, you can mix and match. So we've got online, we've got an integrated pest management document and it has, the, um, it starts out with the ag sill using this to emulsify neem oil. So if you've got a pest problem, right? You can use that neem oil. Okay. In fact, I've got an IPM chart here just to give you some of, and there's a, what's on our chart is RTs and there's some that aren't there that we're going to add. And there's a bunch of them on online, so you can play with it. But we know these work for us, okay? So for your recipes once a week, right? That tells you to wear a mask and all this. And so it starts off with ag sill, okay? Aloe vera and essential oil. Okay, that's like the base one they start with. Um, and it tells you how to mix it and how to apply it. The essential oil, this is, this is gonna be another pro tip, right? So you can go out and buy essential oils. Uh, just go rosemary, eucalyptus, ginger, lemongrass, thyme, cloves, cinnamon, peppermint, etc. Well, don't we grow those plants? So besides eating all those herbs, the reason the herbs have those strong smell, the terpenes, that keeps bugs away, right? Think about it. Those smells keep bugs away. That's why they make essential oils for either therapeutic, medicinal, or spraying. Well, why can't you take your herbs, stick them in a blender with water and add that to your tea that you're going to soak, right? It's not a heavy dose, but there's some in there. And if you do it regular, so now you can use your own plants that you grow. Again, we're getting into sustainability, right? Use your own plants as inputs into your own teas, natural teas to either feed the plants or fight the pests. So that's in, that's like our basic one there. Then you swap them out. We don't always put the same thing and we kind of work it around just because we have fun with it. Some of the teas we make, you can apply to the plants and watch the leaves actually turn colors and flush on. They're taking it in and they're taking the nutrients in. You can watch them change colors, passing the nutrients and they'll return back to their colors again. But you can actually see it happening in the plant, which is the craziest thing. First time I did it, I thought I killed something, but it wasn't. Um, so it goes through these different recipes and shows here, okay, some people use Dr. Bonner's. So you can use Dr. Bonner's essential oil with 
Oh, here's one, foliar number five, neem cake, taranjan kelp, all by itself. Okay. So this thing is just full of recipes. We have a botanical, we have a root drench, which is malted barley grain, right? Full power. Okay. And to that, you can add aloe vera or a recipe for is coconut water. Does crazy things for plants too. Young coconuts, the green, green coconuts. That's what we're talking about. Okay. Not the stuff you're drinking, but the actual coconut water. So even if you don't mix it, you still have to make the tea. Yeah. I always say, why don't you get the ingredients? Because oh, you know, I don't feel like making a tea. Well, then stick it on the soil. Yeah, just throw it on there. Throw it on the soil and walk away. Okay. So that's the whole thing with the teas. There, there's many, many different kinds of teas. And that's what I would recommend to people is you get the different ingredients. If you feel like making a tea, make a tea. If you don't feel like making a tea, throw it on top of the soil and let the water soak it in. It just takes a little longer. We put in our soils to start. That's how we do it. And then we just keep adding things to it because we're trying to build our soils up. So I have gone sometimes four weeks without doing something. And I see no negative effects. Okay. I mean, I push the limit to say, how long can I go without doing anything and have a problem? And I've gotten four weeks before I even begin to think about something showing up on my plants. Then I get back into the tea, start feeding them, take care of them. So there's a lot of ways you can do this. You can find the, the, the recipes on our website. Uh, we're adding more. Uh, a lot of clients just call us and say, can you just make me a 15 pound bag of the feed tea? Okay. And that's great. But I want people to understand that um, there's other ingredients that you could have that you could use proactively and reactively. So if you had a bag of this, you could do wonder. If you just had, if you have these right here and some aloe vera, you take care of everything. You could feed your plants. Now that can get expensive buying this isn't cheap. This is $50. Okay. But if you get the right organic compost, you don't need this or you can get it in powder form. So we're working on getting some of these other ingredients in a form where we can give you a bag this size that has all of that in it. And that'll take care of you for months and months and months. But it's all about getting the right cost down and things. And that's what we're working on. This kind of, we got the cost down on all these. We're working on this. This is on its way, but um, yeah. So it's just really a matter of educating yourself to see what you need. Uh, there are people that just grow certain types of plants, right? Like we have uh, like roses. You want your roses to really pop? Two things, caranja and alfalfa. Feed that to your roses. Don't even, don't have to even do a tea. Just feed it to your roses and watch what happens to your rose bushes. It's crazy. So plumerias, a lot of people like to grow plumerias. We use the basic feed tea, okay, with a little bit of humic acid and the plumerias take off and that, that brown scale, whatever it is, it gets, it gets, it's out of there, okay? And they start to pop and bloom. It's just the way the combination of the different nutrients that a plumeria wants, okay? Vegetable gardening, which is most people, that's what we're talking about growing food, we just do the feeder tea and then we add some of these other items here and there. Okay. Um, is there something in particular? Because there's so many different things we could talk about. Is there something in particular? That's a quick question. Sure. Some of the um, teas are foliar and some are soil drenched. And what would be, what determines whether it can be foliar or drenched with these ingredients? Every one of these things we talked about, you can do both. Okay. But I would say this, let's say I got the powdery mildew. That's not on my ground so much. It's really on my leaves. So I would spray both the underside and the top of my leaves first with the double nickel and the, and the, uh, this prebiotic, right? The micronized crab shell meal. If I was into the problem, if I want to be preemptive, I would just spray this, right? But some of that powdery mildew, the spores are going to be in the soil. So I would just spray it there too to catch any of those spores. OK, just just being just thinking about, yeah, I shot the leaves or let's say I missed one leaf or something fell on the ground. I want to make sure I hit everything. OK, but they're all made to do both. We always do it. We do a soil drench and then we do a foliar drench, a leaf drench. 
always get under the underside of the leaves. People always spray the top. That's where it's all happening. <clears throat> okay. Those are the solar panels. That's where it's absorbing everything. That's where the bugs attack. That's where the eggs are at. That's what you need to be checking to see if you have a bug problem. You'll get diseases here. You'll get some here, but you'll mostly get the, the bugs tend to go here and the diseases tend to show up here at first in general. Okay, so you got the best footprint or the footprint is the best fertilizer for your garden. Walk in your garden and take a look. It's the best thing. So you got to have some more questions because I could talk about everything. Sorry. We covered like everything. Every, every piece and okay. prayers. And did you, did you, you talked about, yeah, you talked about all of this. On yeah, the, the only thing we didn't really talk hard on is the wreath and nuts. All right, talk about that. Wreath and nuts, soap nuts. This is what used to make, what used to be in your laundry soap to make suds. That's why they call them soap nuts. They actually make powder out of this. Uh, this is actually a wreath and nut. You just put these in water and you soak them overnight and you get this brown syrupy liquid. Do not bubble this in a bubbler because it will make foam like crazy. Um, but we'll pour off that liquid and we'll get like three uses out of a small handful of nuts. And I just stick them in a 16 ounce bottle, right? And I put maybe, I put maybe six of these things in there. I get that brown liquid and I can do it three times. You can take what's left over and put it in your washing machine in one of these bags. Those are. Put some wreath of nuts, tie this up, throw it in your laundry. S natural soap. It'll smell great, right? Um, but this has got saffinins in it. You can use this to emulsify oils as well. Okay. Um, probably works as good as Dr. Bonner's soap. Okay. It's all natural. It's got some other things in it. Uh, we use this a lot sometimes just to mellow everything out. Remember in your neem and your karanja, there's some residual oil after they crush the seed. This is enough to emulsify without having to shake it up. So we'll, we'll do our tea and then at the very end, we'll throw that in and then pour it in our sprayer. But this is kind of neat. I think this is like, what? Two pounds or something. And what was it? $15 or we get this out of uh, uh, Mountain Rose. And this bag will last you years, believe it or not. But it's great to get in the garden. Now, we have some soap nut trees here in Florida. Okay. If you're lucky enough to have one, if you want to go pick them and dry them out and go through all that process, you're more than welcome. But we actually do have a tree here that can provide the same type of process, believe it or not. Okay. Um, kind of just, that's the basics of it all. Um, aloe vera, like I said, we got powder coming. Um, you can use something like this. You can buy it online. I think Publix sells this. Um, or you can use fresh aloe vera. Now you can use the same ones, either the powder, this or fresh with North Atlantic sea kelp and humic acid and make a rooting gel. That'll do 10,000 plants and the cost cost about $10 when you mix that. Storage of all of this, is it pretty simple or do you have to have any special containers or temperature or anything like no, that? No, it's, it's um, you know, you don't want to be breathing the dust, like any kind of dust. Uh, we just keep it out of the sunlight and, you know, we keep it as cool as possible. You know, if it's 120 degrees, it's going to bake. If it's, you know, it's negative, it's going to freeze. But we have this in our uh, in our garages and cabinets, and uh, you know when we were first doing this. Now it's in big cans, but you don't <clears> have a situation where you have to throw any out because they were stored improperly. No, um, this you have to refrigerate when you open it. If you buy the liquid from the store, that's why we grow the aloe vera plant because it grows so well here in our native soil without doing anything and throws pups off. And we actually use the aloe vera in our house. We fillet it, dip it, we eat it, we use it for burns or whatever. And we, we uh, put it in the blender and put it in our teas uh, for the plants because the plants love aloe vera. It's magic for, you know, cosmetics and all the health benefits that we all know that aloe vera is used for. Well, the plants love it too. And so if you can grow it, again, it's one of those inputs that grows native and you can use it for so many different things. Again, if you had nothing else and something was attacking your plant, you put aloe vera on it 
it's going to kick the SAR into the plant. That that the defense of the plant is going to jump up and start calling up everything it can to go and fight it. <clears throat> Depends how much nutrients it's got to pull and what it's fighting, if it's going to win or not. But it makes the plants kick in and do what it's got to do. Now imagine if it did have all the ingredients in the ground or you were adding stuff. Okay, so it's just all about what's in your soil. <laughs> so thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, you can reach us at uh, revivalgardening.com. We deliver locally currently. We're working on shipping to go to the rest of the state, but currently we deliver locally. Uh, we deliver worm castings, um, our specialty compost. We make the Clackamas Coot soil mix with all of this already in it, just add water. Um, a lot of these ingredients are already up there. Within the next week, you'll see all of the new ingredients. Uh, we also sell the Rain Science Grow Bags with the Clackamas Coot mix in it. So you can just stick it on your thing and pop your plant and go. Um, but if you have any questions, you can go on and uh, just contact us. We're more than happy to, to help you out. All of our clients get free consultations and we do everything in person. So you'll go online, you'll order what you want. We'll get a, a form from you that says how you want to be contacted, email or by phone. And and uh, that's we'll look the order over. We'll get a hold of you, confirm and set a time for uh, delivery. It's, it's that simple.